In today's episode of Gender Science, we are talking about the brain, specifically the finding that the brains of transgender kids align with their gender identity and not their biological sex. Specifically, there was a fascinating study in May of 2018 by the European Society of Endocrinology titled Transgender Brains Are More Like Their Desired Gender From an Early Age. And they scanned, using MRI scans, the brains of 160 transgender teens. And what they found is the brain's activation patterns and structure of transgender girls resembled the brains of cisgender girls. And similarly, the brains of transgender boys resembled the brains of cisgender boys. So the key takeaway, the transgendered kids' brains resemble their gender identity and not their biological sex. Ready to learn more about this topic, about the gender spectrum and also the sex spectrum? Go ahead and check out this article, The Gender Spectrum, A Scientist Explains Why Gender Isn't Binary. You can find it at cadehildreth.com forward slash gender dash spectrum. With several states now starting to introduce chromosome testing in order to play girls' sports, many cisgender girls are about to get a surprise that they didn't expect. I'm here to tell you about the 1996 Olympics and how that was the end to all chromosome testing for the Olympic Games. Prior to 1996, most sex testing was done via panels of men doing external and internal gynecological exams, which by the way, some states have passed like Ohio this year. This slowly transformed into the use of chromosome testing, which culminated in the 1996 Summer Olympics, where they released the anonymized results and it shocked people. They discovered that eight cisgender women had Y chromosomes and didn't know it. They considered themselves fully cisgender and developed normally as any cisgender woman would. However, it's likely that they had intersex conditions or androgen insensitivity. Following this, the IOC banned chromosomal testing for sex testing in the Olympics. This is because they quickly learned that there is simply no biological way to define a woman without excluding some cisgender athletes. A lot of states and a lot of cisgender competitors in those states are about to learn this lesson the hard way. This information is for anyone who needs to hear it. Back when I was an undergrad and took my first human genetics class, obviously we had a lab and I asked my professor why we didn't test our own chromosomes for chromosomal variations. You see, at the time we were learning about intersex conditions. We had all the equipment, it was readily available, so why weren't we able to do that on ourselves? Keep in mind, each lecture class was over 300 people and I will never forget what she said to me. If we did that, at least one to two people in each of my lecture classes are going to have to be referred to mental health services. And we don't have that kind of setup. Because can you imagine living your entire life as a man, believing that you are a man, to find out that your chromosomes do not tell you that? It isn't the media, it's science. And our system isn't set up to deal with that. When did homosexuality become associated with sin? Well, the word homosexual didn't enter the Bible until February 11th, 1946 in the Revised Standard Version. So the word homosexual was then retroactively added into passages, including 1 Corinthians 6-9 and 1 Timothy 1-10, two of the most common passages used to condemn homosexuality today, even though the original words did not insinuate homosexual. The two original words are malakoi and arsenikoitai, two words that scholars today agree would be better interpreted as pervert, pedophile, or young boy. So these words were referencing sex with minors, not same-sex intercourse. In the New Testament, pedophilia was included in the wrongful expressions of lust alongside orgies and other sexual activities associated with outside religions and cultures. But we've translated the word pedophile or pervert to mean homosexual, literally just changing the word, ignoring the original text, and replacing pedophile or pervert with the word homosexual, and then creating a theology of sin around homosexuality. We're going to look at homosexuality in the Old Testament and how theologies against homosexuality have emerged over the last few centuries in the following reels. Well, it looks like an ordinary lobster to you, but it's actually half male, half female. As a biologist, this is actually something that I love to point to when people try to tell me that biological sex is a very easy, cut and dry, black and white type thing. That is called a bilateral gynandromorph. That means that that lobster has a male half of the body with all male cells and a female half of the body with all female cells. Here are some more pictures of bilateral gonandomorphs. You can see these butterflies and these birds. Here's a couple more birds. Here's an insect. Here's a chicken. And what's really cool is that this doesn't even have to happen in the whole organism. It can happen just in the gonads. You can have ovarian tissue on one side and testicular tissue on the other side of the same organ. So even though you are phenotypically one sex or the other, your gonads are kind of both. Those are called ovotestes, by the way, and I haven't put any pictures here because those pictures are far more graphic. 
But even though ganandromorphy is somewhat of a rare thing, the whole situation of having both male and female components of the same body is very much not a rare thing. There are true hermaphrodites, which have both male and female reproductive parts for their whole lives, things like slugs, for example. And then there are sequential hermaphrodites, which start off as one sex and become another sex later. And that's not a rare occurrence. That's the whole species. For example, all shrimp start off as males and become females later. We call that sequential hermaphrodism. In particular, that's called protandry, which means male first. Other sequentially hermaphroditic animals are progynic, which means female first. And others still are bidirectional, meaning they can switch back and forth seemingly at will. <laughs> and all that's just talking about animals. That's not even talking about plants, because while some plants are dioecious, they have different sexes, other plants are monoecious. They have only one sex, but that doesn't mean that they don't still have different size gametes and different sex organs. They absolutely do. Imperfect flowers are flowers that are either male or female. Perfect flowers are flowers that have both male and female parts. And sometimes plants exhibit sequential hermaphrodism just like animals do. Although in that case, when a flower starts off as male and becomes female later, we call that being dicogamous, which is one of my favorite words in all of botany. The point is, life is weird, and sex is weird, and absolutely nothing in biology is just basic biology. a social event recently and I was making small talk with a woman who I don't know very well. Um, our paths have crossed before so it was all very surface level when all of a sudden she said, boy, I don't envy you being in education right now at this time in the, in the world. And I took it as a word of kind of comfort, sort of, I know things are hard for you and, you know, I'm thinking of you guys. But lo and behold, she kept talking and I quickly realized that was not at all her intention. Um, what she followed up with was, oh gosh, all these gender issues and names and identity pronouns. She said, I just wouldn't have time for it. I'm not sure she knew me at all for starting that conversation. So of course I inquired her, what do you mean? She said, well, if it was me and I was a teacher, I'm calling you what the roster says. I don't want to know anything about what you prefer. I said, let me tell you a quick story. My birth name is Kate. For as long as I could remember, I don't like the name Kate. Disclaimer, I don't like it for me. Other Kates I know are lovely. Princess Kate, you're beautiful. But Kate never felt like it fit me. As a result, my entire life, I've been Katie. But I can tell you which teachers consistently called me Kate, even after I asked them to stop. Probably don't have to tell you my impression of those teachers. It wasn't good. So I told her this and she quickly said, no, no, I'm not opposed to a nickname. I said, well, if you're not opposed to a student asking to be called something else, What's the issue? Knowing darn well what the issue is. I just wanted to hear her say it. She followed up flustered by saying, I guess I just don't understand. If, you, if you're gay and you wanna be gay, go be gay. But why does everyone else have to know about it? Once again, I don't know why you're starting this conversation with me of all people. So I turned to her and I said, have you ever met my husband? She said, sure. I said, isn't he lovely? She got a big smile. She said, yes. I said, he's kind and loving and supportive. He's my best friend. She said, I know, I love watching you two together. I said, sometimes I can't even just help but talk about how much I love him. Her face froze, she saw where I was going. And I said, and don't you think that's my right? Again, she said nothing. What a privilege it is, I said, that I get to talk about him as much as I want to to other people. That I don't have to hide our love. That by your own admission, it's beautiful to watch. So explain to me why not everyone deserves that. Why do they have to go, as you put it, be gay in secret. Why do people have to hide who they are to make you comfortable? Unsurprisingly, she had little to say. I wasn't even about to get into gender identity having nothing to do with sexual preference. So the moral of the story is if you want affirmation that your prejudices and biases are correct, today is not the day with me and neither is tomorrow. Well, I'm non-binary, and I don't usually refer to myself as a man or a woman, um, with two exceptions. One, when I'm a grown-ass man, and you're not going to disrespect a grown-ass man. And two, when I'm doing my biology homework, and I'm a woman in STEM.